and we bow down our heads as we pray. Father, we want to thank you for another time in your presence. Thank you for the first teaching. Thank you for every air that heard it. We're trusting you, Father, that even the second one, as it is your counsel, that it develop wings and fly around the earth, that through it you bring sound doctrine to humanity. And through it, your purpose for us in this time will be fulfilled. That righteousness will fill the earth. And that everyone that will hear this teaching, that your spirit will take hold of them. As many that are not yet saved will be saved. As many that are saved by living their life in uh, unrighteous ways will see the power to live a righteous life. Also pray that everyone that has one body or the other trusting you for help to this station as they hear, let their body be lifted. Thank you, blessed Father. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. I welcome you to the second teaching in our series of teachings on the purpose of man. In our first teaching, we looked at Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. And from there, with several other passages in the Bible, we discovered that there was a word that existed before us, before man came. And that that word was ruled by Lucifer on behalf of God. And that that same word had spirits as the habitants, animals, birds, and uh, fishes. We realize that um, Satan, who was Lucifer then, maintained the righteousness that was expected by God until pride entered him. And I rose from the earth to heaven to declare autonomy. And God drove him back to earth. And when he came to the earth, it corrupted everything that was on the earth then. God got angry, destroyed them. Though he couldn't kill them, as we know, spirits don't die, but they are bodies that were terrestrial. So those bodies were destroyed by the floor that God brought upon them. So on earth today, we have Satan with spirits living with us who don't have bodies to operate. And that um, when God destroyed the earth of that time, he promised Satan that he was going to humiliate him. He also promised him that he was going to destroy him. That is to say, before destruction will be his humiliation. God told him that some people were going to come who were going to humiliate him. So today in this second teaching, we are going to be looking at who those people Ah, and the things that God considered in creating those people. You remember in the book of Psalm, chapter 139, the Bible says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, meaning man is not an accidental creation. A lot of things were considered before man concluded on the structure of man. Those are the things we are going to look at and what God is expecting of man. Um, in doing that, we're going to be relying, first of all, on 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45. Let us look at that. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 45. And so it, it is written, The first Adam was made a living soul, and the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. What's God saying here? God is saying there are two Adams. There was first one, there was second one. The first one is the Adam that we know. The second one is Jesus Christ who came to redeem us. Why did God call them Adams? Because they came to fulfill the same purpose. Why the first Adam failed, the second Adam succeeded. It therefore means what God considered 
when he wanted to create the first Adam was the same thing considered when he was sending the second Adam to us. So we're going to be looking at what were those things that God considered when he was sending the second Adam. Definitely, those were the same thing considered when he was making the first Adam. So, we said in our first teaching that something very paramount to God is his righteousness. That the constitution and culture of heaven is righteousness. And that why he destroyed that word of Lucifer was because they lost the righteousness that was expected of them. That is to say, the first thing God considered when he was bringing forth to man being, or this next set of people that he was going to create, let's not call them man being yet. Let's look at the thing God uh, considered. So, this set of people that God was going to create, the first thing he decided that was paramount in his heart was righteousness. Let's see the book of uh, um, Romans chapter 14, verse 17. We said in our first uh, teaching that we're going to be relying on Bible passages, scriptures, so that whatever we're saying, we back them up. We're not just guessing here. We're telling us what actually took place or what actually is taking place now. So we're going to be reading a lot of uh, scriptures and we're going to be very deliberate because it is not a teaching class. I mean, sorry, it's not a preaching class, but a teaching class so that everybody can understand what God is expected of us. So we're going to Romans chapter 14, verse 17. Romans 14. We're going to verse 17. I want to see something there. And it says, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Now, God is telling us here that something very paramount to him that he cannot waive for whatever reason is his righteousness. Once the righteousness of God is no longer there, there's no longer the kingdom of God. We saw that again in Psalm, um, Psalm sorry, please. In um, Psalm 45, let's go there. Psalm 45. Now, Psalm 45. Verse 6, verse 6, he said, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. Is a right scepter. So, he's still talking here that the kingdom of God is about righteousness. So, the first thing God considered was righteousness. Now, don't forget in the first one we said that when God was sending Satan, or Lucifer as the case may be, we said Lucifer was already existing in heaven before God sent him to the earth when he was creating the earth to come and rule the earth for him. And that Lucifer was about one of the best that God could send because he was one of those who were very close to God, being his Kiru, and that everywhere God was going, he was always there. So it seemed to be one of the people who understood God most. So God was sending his best when he was sending Lucifer. And that best failed. God realized if the best can fail or could fail, then who will not fail? That lay the lot on Jesus Christ, our Lord. Because if everything God had created could not succeed in bringing the kind of righteousness that God wanted, then he had no choice but to send himself. Let's see how the Bible put that in the book of Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5. Like I said, we're not doing a guesswork. We're looking at the Bible. So we want to support what we just said now with the Bible. We're reading from verse 1 down to 8. Don't forget I told you that we're going to be looking at second Adam how he was sent to know how the first Adam 
was sent. He said, And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to lose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven, nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. Notice there that a search was made in heaven. That verse 3 told us that a search was made in heaven, and nobody was worthy. A search was made on earth, nobody was worthy. Then let's see what happened next in verse 5. And one of the elders said unto me, that God was giving John privilege to see what happened when Jesus was coming to the earth. Don't forget that the Bible said before even Jesus came, that decision was taken. He said from the foundation of the earth, we got there. So this thing that John was saying was just a privilege to see what happened maybe years back, millions of years back, when God was deciding when Jesus was going to come. We know Jesus was slain from the foundation of the earth before every man came. It was a privilege given to John to see into what happened in taking decision on how Jesus was going to come. So, he saying here that, verse 5, And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, are prevailed to open the book, and to lose the seven seeds thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat on the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them halves and golden vials, full of odors, which are the prayers of the saint. This place was telling us how such was made in heaven, made on earth. Nobody was worthy to carry the scroll that was in God's hands to solve human problem. And that the notice or John realized that a lamb came and took up that book. We all know that that lamb is Jesus Christ our Lord. So this was what went on when God was trying to select who was coming to the earth. The Lord fell on God himself, God the Son. Because nobody will not fail God in bringing righteousness to the surface of the earth. So we are concluded that the first thing God decided was righteousness. And that Jesus was going to come for man. Here now, we are talking about the first Adam. So God was concluding the person that will come to earth will be God himself. The second thing God considered, we said in uh, the first teaching that God said he was going to humiliate, disgrace, and make Satan look worthless before some people. God brought that into consideration. He needed somebody who would do that for him. Let's see the things that God looked at when he was making that decision. Um, he was trying to say he wanted somebody who would succeed where devil failed. For you to humiliate someone, you have to bring somebody who could do what that person couldn't do. So God was looking for someone who was going to succeed where uh, 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 Lucifer failed. And that for the person to be able to humiliate him, you must be somebody who is at par with him or you are below him in standard. So you have the justification to say you failed. But if you bring somebody who is superior, who could do better, then you want justification because you can stand up to you and say, you brought somebody better than me. That's why he succeeded. Now, that means if God was going to humiliate the devil, he needed somebody who would be below the devil in standard. What standard are we looking at here? Don't forget also in that... Uh, First teaching, we said the thing that corrupted the devil was his beauty. 
And we saw in Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 13, that his beauty was because of what it was made of. Precious stones. It was made from precious stones. That was what corrupted him. His beauty corrupted him. So, God was looking at, if his beauty corrupted him, I was going to use something that is not as beautiful as him to deal with him. So note that too. God himself was going to come. God was going to use something that is inferior to him in, 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 in covering to, um, to humiliate him. Now, don't forget God has terrestrial body. Sorry, he has celestial body. To live on it, we concluded that too in the uh, first teaching we did, that for you to live on it, you must have terrestrial body. That is, your body structure must be adapted to the art. You can't just come and live on it except you carry the kind of body that can live on it. So angels cannot live on it. They can come like a fish will come out of water and return to water. So they can come briefly and return. But they cannot live with it with us there on earth because they are carrying the body that is celestial. Same way, God is carrying body that is celestial. God can come and live with us on earth. Then, God concluded he was going to put a covering on himself so that he can come and live with us. That covering, like a cloth or a, 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 an empty case, he will put himself that we have ter terrestrial body so that he can live on it. And don't forget what also said, that that body must be made of something inferior to what devil body was made of. We also realized that um, when God said he was going to humiliate him, God also meant he was going to use human beings to judge the fallen angels, to judge some of those creatures that fell. We we'll see that also as we proceed. But I want us to look at the aspect of the inferiority first. Um, now, if God was going to clothe himself, come to the earth, and live with us, I mean, and live and be the one to live on it and institute the righteousness that God wanted, he would not have the justification to humiliate the devil because God is superior to the devil. So, the thought of creating a front, somebody who will come instead of God came up. But like we said, you know that if anybody came, that person was going to fall because the best of God has fallen. So, the intent of God was, he was going to create a, somebody who to front, he will back that person up, he will be the one telling that person what to do, and that person will be able to succeed if he will listen to him, then um, God concluded the front, I mean, a front is going to come. The front will carry inferior body. God was going to come with the front. Again, don't forget that if a front uh, came and God came with the front and God suggesting to the front, that will still give God no justification to humiliate the devil. Then God felt he had to reduce himself to something less than himself. Then he had to come with a dimension of himself, not the fullness of himself, to back up that person who we call front. We're going to be looking at all these Bible passages to back them as we go down. That means God will give a dimension of himself to that personality he was going to create to back him and suggest to him how to achieve righteousness on it. Don't also forget that we said the only thing that can bring the righteousness God was expecting on earth was the fullness of God. So if God was going to uh, give uh, a, a dimension of himself to back the person else, then he had to develop a way to bring the fullness of himself to that dimension. Then the talk talk, uh, 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 procreation came up. Procreation that is multiple of that front 
each uh, front will carry a dimension of God. So that by the time you add up all the fronts together, it will be a full God in operation. We can see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 17. 1 Corinthians 10, 17. Let's see what the Bible is saying there. First Corinthians 10 17 is saying, For we be many and one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one body. He said, We be many is one body. So it's as if you are trying to, to, to divide this one body to several places so that when they come together, they be one whole. God divides Himself into several places. The bringing together of all the several places, the several dimension of himself, is the oneness of God. That's what this place is saying here. That all of us who have been put together, who are doing the will of God, is the fullness and the wholeness of God is one body. We're going to see that again in Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Let's see how Paul put it there. He said, verse 4 and 5. He said, for as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we be many and one body in Christ, and every one member one of another, so that we can have several of these fronts and several dimensions of God backing up all the fronts. The fullness of them will be the fullness of God. Again, God realized that since it was going to be a dimension of him that will back on that person, not the fullness of him. And this personality, we have to have a will of his own so that he could take decision what to do, whether to go what the will of God or not the will of God, so that he will be justified in humiliating the devil. He needed to give him a will of his own. That is, ability to make choice between two things or several things. And a dimension of God was going to back him up. Since he has a will, the likelihood is that one day he might refuse to follow God. And if he refused, God knew then he was going to fall. If he was going to fall, God was not interested in destruction of the world, bringing new set of people destruction. Then thought of what was he going to do? They needed to plan what they call redemption for humanity even before creation or for whoever will come on earth before creation. Let's see that in Revelation 13, 8. Revelation 13, 8. He said, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the earth. Now, this way is telling us that Jesus that came some 2,000 years ago had been planned before the world was even created. God already knew that if this creature he was trying to make, who will have a will of his own, who will have a backing of a, a dimension of himself, was going to fall. And that since he was not ready to keep destroying people or creatures and keep bringing new salt, he needed to plan a redemption for him. That means man was not going to be a spirit or whoever was going to come was not going to be a spirit. Why? Because spirit cannot be redeemed by their structures. Spirit can, don't carry go. Spirits are legalistic. Once a spirit offends, he must go for it. And once you offend the spirit, you must go for it. And that's why the Bible told us that you can offend God the Father, you'll be forgiven. You can offend God the Son, you'll be forgiven. But if you offend God the Holy Spirit, there is no forgiveness. And we have several passages in the Bible where it said, don't say anything you don't mean. That's Ecclesiastes chapter 5, before an angel, because he won't forgive you. Spirits don't forgive 
and neither could they be forgiven. That's why God did not forgive Satan when he sinned. So, God needed to make a structure for the creation he was going to bring in a way that he could be forgiven. And that means he was not going to be a spirit. I know we have all believed that man is a spirit. Bible never says so, and there is no reference in the Bible that man is a spirit. I don't want to go into that because that's not our teaching today. The day we look at that, we look at the structure of man and how man is not a spirit. Now, when God decided the man was going to fall, he made plan for his redemption. We have seen that in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8. So let's look at another thing that God considered. Okay, I said here that that creation that God was trying to make was man. Because looking at the Bible, we discover that all these things that were set, all these criteria, only man has fulfilled that. So let's look at man criteria, all that we have, we have seen, uh, uh, enumerated earlier, that man fulfilled them. One, God said he was going to make that person from inferior material so that he can help him to humiliate the devil if he succeeds when, when devil failed. Let's see that in Genesis chapter 3, verse 19. Genesis 3, 19. I said, we'll be reading the Bible to back off our claims. Genesis 3.19 He said, In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it was thou taken. For dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. So we're seeing here now that man was made from the dust. And I've told her the reason why man had to be made from the dust. To have a standard in his body structure, the covering, the body, to be made from material inferior to the devil. So that God will have justification to say, you fade where somebody who is less than you succeeded. When I say less than you, I mean in body structure. I don't mean inheritance. We are better than angels, devil, in inheritance, but not in power, not in body structure. We must get that very clearly. Before some people say, uh, we have been taught that uh, we are higher than the angels. We are only higher than them in inheritance as children of God, not in power, not in body structure. Then two, we said, he will humiliate the devil. That is very paramount to God. I know we have asked the question, why did God leave the devil to be roaming the earth and to be destroy human lives and all manners of things that the devil is doing? It's because when the devil fell, God said he was going to humiliate him. He was not going to destroy him. He couldn't, he couldn't judge him. I mean, he couldn't forgive him because it was a spirit. And God said, with all the beauty I put into your creation, you disappointed me. You live with me. You knew the way I live. You knew everything about me and you fell. I'm going to put you to shame. I'm going to do things that will make you, uh, uh, that will belittle you. Sorry, I forgot to quote that uh, verse. I believe that those following us are those who started from our first teaching. We concluded that in Ezekiel chapter 28, verses, I think, 16, 17, 18. And Isaiah chapter 14, verses 16 and 17. We saw it there. God said some people were going to gloat on Satan. Some people were going to say, Ah, so you are the one that was doing all of this. Some people were going to ridicule him for God. We also saw that Jesus even did that in Colossians chapter 2, verse 15. It's one of the things that Jesus accomplished for God. Let's even look at that before we continue. That Jesus fulfilled that because it's expected of us to fulfill that too. Colossians. So that you know that it's very paramount to God that Satan is humiliated. Verse 15 of Colossians chapter 2. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them on it. 
Bible is very meticulous on how he puts his words. So if he said he made a public show, it was because that was part of what God wanted. And we have told you in Ezekiel and Isaiah that he said some people will humiliate him. Humiliating the devil is the main reason why devil was not chained from the beginning, unlike others, and why it was not thrown into a fire. Because God felt bad that with all the things I made you with, you still failed, then I will humiliate you. But well, continuing with that man fulfill what God um, considered in creating someone who will do the purposes he want the creation that will come to the earth will do. Let's see Psalm 8, verse 2 to 4, humiliation of the devil. Psalm 8, 2 to 4. This is a psalm that God was talking about how beautiful man was made. Let's read it from verse 2. It says, Out of the mouth of babies, mark that, and sucklings, as thou ordained strength, because of thy enemies, that thou mightest steal the enemy and the avenger. Mark that. Out of the mouth of babies and suckling. That's figurative. It's talking about something of less value. Something that the value is less than what is expected. That out of their mouth I will ordain strength because of my enemies. Who are the enemies of God? Of course. Not human being, because this place is talking about man generally, not about born again or not born again. So it's talking about people who are rebelling against God who were not human beings. Say, out of the mouth of sucklings, weaker creation will I humiliate you. Verse 3 When I consider thy heavens and the work of thy hands, the moon and the star, which thou art ordained. Verse 4 What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visited him? So it's talking about my the creation. I say, What is man? You want to use him to humiliate the devil. You want to use him to humiliate your enemies. Devils, angels, uh, fallen spirits. So we see from this passage that man was created to fulfill that purpose of humiliating the devil. Let's also see um, Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. Genesis 1, 28. We see one of the uh, instructions that God gave to man when he created him. Genesis 1, 28. He said, And God bless him, and said, and said unto him, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it. Mark that. And have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowls of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. If we look at that passage, God mentioned everything that he created. He mentioned uh, the fish of the sea, the fowl there, and the animals that creep upon the earth. And he said what man should do today is to dominate them. Don't forget, say dominate them. But if you look at that, that sentence, I mean that, that um, uh, scripture, he said, be fruitful, multiply. That's a blessing. Multiply, bless, and replenish, and subdue. That means there was something there that God wanted you to subdue. What does it mean to subdue? To overcome. To bring under control. If you want to bring somebody under control, it means that person has the capacity to refuse you. He has that propensity to say no to you. So God was talking to man here that there are people on earth with you that you need to subdue for me. He was not talking to animals. You don't subdue animals. You tame them. You dominate them. You don't subdue birds. You don't subdue uh, uh, um, fishes. So when God says subdue the heart, he was talking about the creatures that were already on earth. They were not physical. The fallen uh, spirits and, and Lucifer that God was saying, Subdue them for me. Humiliate them for me. Help me to deal with them. So we see that man fulfilled the purpose in his creation of humiliating the devil. We also know from the character of God that he loves using the weak thing to uh, uh, despise the, the, the strong. And then um, 
um, he said the foolish things also to despise the wise. It is the desire of God that things you are not expecting that good things you come out from is what you bring something good from. So man was created, even though from lower material than what devil was made of, to humiliate the devil. There was a saw that um, that the that he said um, the creation should have a will of his own. Man also fulfilled that in Genesis 1 26, a will of his own, yet backed up by God. Let's see how that happened. Genesis 1 26. Genesis 1 26. It says, um, and God said, let us make man in our image and our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowls of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creepy thing that creep upon the earth. He was talking here within themselves, the Trinity. He said, let us make man after our own image in our likeness. What does image mean? It means in their nature in their character. Why in likeness means in their glory. The glory of God, we said that in our first teaching. I'm first teaching, I think we mentioned something like that. Oh, okay, sorry. I was talking to some people about glory. In the glory of God is his wisdom. In the glory of God is his strength. In the glory of God is his power. In the glory of God is his riches. In the glory of God is his honor. Everything that makes God is in his glory. So when God was saying, I was going to make man in my image and my likeness, he was talking in his character and his glory. Now, that is confirming to us that man was backed up by God's character, was backed up when he was created by God's glory. And we know the glory of God is in his spirit. The glory of God is hidden in his spirit and the likeness and the character, the nature of God is in his spirit. That is why when God created man, he put his spirit in him. Adam was created with the, with the spirit of God in him. I'm going to prove that to us later because some people believed Adam didn't carry the spirit of God. No, when the Bible says in his nature, where did God put nature? He put it in his spirit. The nature of God lives in his spirit. The character of God, the behavior of God lives in God. In his spirit, not in any other thing. So, Adam had the spirit of God within him. But with his own personal will, he could decide to follow that spirit that, that uh, 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 is within him. Or refuses that spirit. Because he has his own spirit. When we look at the structure of human being, we know that he has his own spirit. So, man could decide to follow the spirit of God within him or follow his own personal spirit or soul. We also see that um, in the passage we have read that man could procreate. We don't need to go into that again. Genesis 1.28, he said multiply and feed the earth. We also saw in Revelation 13 verse 8 that God talked about the redemption of humanity. So of all the things on earth, we discovered that all the things that God considered when he wanted to create the structure, I mean the, 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 the creature that will humiliate the devil for him, all those things are complete a man. So man was that creature that God made to come and humiliate the devil for him. Now let's now go into our teaching proper. We're just trying to look at what God considered in creating man. So it will give us understanding of how God expects us to live on earth here. We mentioned that this creature called man will have his own way, that power to take decision. And we also said that he will have God living in him. That means if he will have his own will, he will be able to take decision between two variables, two different things. If there is no choice to make, then there is no will. You don't talk about will except you talk about choice. So God had to bring the tree of good, knowledge of good and evil to the garden of Eden so that he can have choice to pick from. I know so many people have asked, why did God create the tree of good and evil in the garden? It's because man is to have a will and a will will help him to take decision on what to do. 
like I said, I said, validation of will. Why God put the tree of life there is because he wanted to validate that we have will. We have choices to make. We have things we can take decisions from. Without that, there will be no will. That's why the tree was there. Then two, God had another option not to put the tree there so that we will not have option at all. If we don't have option at all, that means what God was creating was going to be a robot, like a robot, programmed to do move left, he move left. Move right, he moves right. Um, um, jump up, he jumps up. And you agree with me that that won't be a world that even you and I will want. That if you want to go to the toilet, God will be the one to decide. He will program us to go to the toilet. If you want to marry, he will program you to marry. If you want to do anything, he will program you to do whatever you want to do. Two, we're going to get there that one of the things God wants us to do for him when he says humiliation is to judge angels, to judge those angels that are fallen and those spirits that are fallen. If we are to judge them, then we must have the, the choice to make be, whether to go their own route or to go the God's route. Without giving us that will, God will not have the justification to say, I will humiliate you. He will not have the justification to tell the devil you fail why something less uh, in quality than you succeeded. Then again, God put the tree of uh, knowledge of good and evil there because he wanted to demonstrate love to us. You know, God is love and in everything he does, he considers his love. Now, God said it is love for you to bring God someone, give him every resource, everything that we ever need in life, make him beautiful, enjoy himself, and at the end of the day, you are not dictating to him. God was establishing his love by putting the tree of knowledge of evil and good in the garden to give man the opportunity to make his own choice without being forced, without being coerced. I know that none of us will like that we have parents who will send us to school, graduate from college, everything. They immediately will graduate, say, it will say, before you spend your money, your salary, I must be the one you consult. I must be the one to tell you how you spend your money. Where you want to marry, I will choose your wife for you. Where anything you want to buy a car, I will do everything for you just because I sent you to school or because I'm your father. That is anti love. So not having that option of going the other route there will mean that man will be fixed on what choice he will make in life. God was demonstrating love through the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now, that will that God gave to man has implication. The implication of it is that man will have to decide whether to follow God or to follow the devil through the tree of good, uh, knowledge of good and evil that God has planted there and the tree of life in the garden of Eden. God was expecting that man would be reasonable and take the choice of following him. And that's what the Bible talked about, the lordship of Jesus Christ. When you are saved, it's one of the things you are going to say that you believe in the Lordship and Lord Jesus Christ. That means I will submit completely to whatever the Spirit is telling me to do. I will not take decision by myself. I will not follow my own leading, but the direction or the Spirit of God or whatever God is telling me by whatever means, whatever is telling me is what I'm going to do. That is the meaning of the Lordship of Christ. Don't forget I said God wanted to come and live on earth. He couldn't come because he needed to humiliate the devil. Then he couldn't come because he had a body that is celestial. Only terrestrial body could live here. Yeah. That is why he created man. Man came to front for him. That is to say, you are only important or necessary on earth here to the extent to which you allow God in you to have expression. The day you stop allowing God to have expression, the day you stop allowing God to dictate to you, to tell you what to do, or the day you stop 
following whatever the Spirit of God is telling you, that day you have outlived your usefulness. Because they're only useful to the extent to which you allow God to live. He wanted to live. That's why he created you. You were not necessary. So when you see people living their own life the way they like, the way they like, they are trying to humiliate God himself, who has said that he wanted to live, but I need someone to live through. I realize that so many Christians do not understand this part of uh, creation. That we are not created because God wanted us to just come. But we are created because God wanted to live. He couldn't live. Because him living here, he doesn't have the body structure. And he won't be able to humiliate the devil that has promised he was going to humiliate him. Then he said you should come and front for him. Your importance is to the extent to which God is the one directing all that you are doing. Like the story of Luke chapter 13. He said it, that that tree was cumbering the ground. That there was no point. They should cut it off. If not that God is a merciful God, every human being, the point, the moment we stop being led by God, we are no longer useful. You have failed the purpose of creation. The day you want to leave your country to travel to another country for greener pastor, without God being the one dictating to you or telling you to do that, you have outlived your youthfulness. That is not why you are created. You weren't created to come and decide where to stay. You are created to come and listen to the spirit within you to tell you where he wants you to stay. Where uh, you should go, where you should not go, what you should do, what you should not do. Because that's the reason that he wants to carry out a purpose. We're not created for comfort like people think we are. Of course, God wants us to be comfortable. But comfortable to the extent to which God is finding expression in us. But Christianity today is all about what we can get from God. The reverse has become the case. God is no longer the one that is living. We are the one that is living and God has become the front. Why we are the one dictating everything. And I say here that, that um, from this, the way we live now, I've seen about three or four categories of human being. One, man that does not have the spirit of God in him. That is, you know, immediately after Adam fell, the spirit of God left him. So we have women been living on earth. They have their own spirit, but they don't have the spirits of God in them. That is a class of people. There's no doubt about that. Those kinds of people are going to hell because God is not even there to tell them what to do, what not to do. So whatever they are doing is in support of the devil and they are helping the devil to tell God that God, you're the one that made me fail. Because you didn't create me well. Then we have another set. The are spirit, but not submitting. They, are, they, are, they claim they are born again. So at, at the point of uh, salvation, the spirit of God comes into them. And the spirit of God is living in them. But they are not yielding to the leading of the spirit. They are not living according to the precept of righteousness. Those set of people... They might even be prosperous. They might be doing well. And sometimes make mistakes to think because they are doing well, God is with them. Mm. When we go into other teachings, we realize that the way God made man is that every woman, being whether born again or not, we have equal um, access to resources, equal access to wealth, equal access to sound living, equal access to health. So you don't need to be born again. You don't need to know God to live a good life. We'll see that in our subsequent teachings. And even if you look around you, you have seen that the richest people are not even born again. A lot of people are not born again and they have sound health. You know that. And a lot of people are born again and they don't have sound health. So when it comes to issue of resources, you don't use that to determine whether you are serving God or not. The mercy of God, the goodness of God, that's why the Bible says, our God is good. They asked Jesus Christ. Somebody said, good master. He said, no, don't call me good master. He said, only one person is good. And that person is God. So because God is a good God, he has made everything available to everybody regardless of who you are. Be you a terrorist, be you a murderer, 
be you a fornicator, be you the, uh, the powerless person on earth, God has made resources available to everybody. So don't use the fact that you are doing well to think that God is on your side or you are doing the will of God. No. As long as the Holy Spirit is not the one telling you what to do, or righteousness of God is not what you are following, you are not necessary to live on earth according to why God created man. Uh, I tried to, I write down some examples there. I remember sometimes ago, I was praying that wishes around me should die. And uh, one time God said, son, he said, you want these wishes to die? He said, but I created them like I created you. So why do you want me to kill them? That was the last day I stopped praying for witches to die because I know they might not die. Of course, I know God kills some. But the question is, from the time people have been praying about witches die, how many of them have died? Some of them even live up to their 80 or 90. And I realized the best thing I should do to myself is to grow to the level that witches will not be able to trouble me. But that God should kill them, he might never kill them. Why? He created them like he created you too. They might still give their life in the future. And God is hoping that nobody will go to hell, that everybody will be saved. So he's not quick at destroying people because they are misbehaving, because they are witches, because they are bandits, because they are Boko Haram, maybe in Nigeria. Do you even know that it is possible sometimes, maybe for instance, military is firing, for those who are Nigerians, and um, um, they are firing at uh, bandits or maybe Boko Haram, and God will help some of them to escape. Yes, yes. Why? Because he's a good God. He doesn't want anybody to die or that person has given his life. God may know that in the future, this person will do a lot of exploit for me. He won't kill him. He won't kill him. So, that things are working is not what we use to determine whether we are doing the right thing or not. So many of us misunderstand this. Until we give expression to the spirits within us, we are not doing the will of God. We know that the people of Israel in the wilderness, the Bible says God fed them, he did all manners of miracles, and yet he was not happy with them. So, have you given your life to Christ before? And you, you are living your life carelessly the way you like? You might be surprised on the last day that you will not make it. He might be giving you all manners of blessings today. Things might be working for you because you don't need to be born again to get things working for you. The last day, many will be shocked. Then I said there are people who have the Spirit of God also in them. Sometimes they give um, expression to the Spirit. They allow him to have his full expression. Sometimes they don't allow him. Those kind of people too. The day you don't allow him, you allow the devil to stand before God and say, didn't I tell you that they won't succeed where I failed? Like we read in that place of Psalm 8 verse 2. You allow the devil to blaspheme, blaspheme God. At every time you are doing something contrary to righteousness, you are giving the devil the audacity to stand before God and said, I told you that nobody can succeed where I failed. Align them to blaspheme God. And I said the last set of people are those who understand the purpose of why man was created and is aligned the spirit in them to find expression. Everything they do, whether convenient or not convenient, is all about God. We see that even Jesus fulfilled this purpose in John chapter 5, verse 19. Let's see that. John 5, 19. John 5, 19. Sorry, John chapter 5, verse 19. It said, Then answered Jesus and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, The Son can do nothing of himself, but what he said the Father do, 
For what things soever he doeth, this also doeth the Son likewise. Jesus is God. Jesus was in heaven before he came to the earth. Jesus at every point knows or knew what God would be doing. But he never took advantage of that to take decision by himself. He would still wait on God to see what God is doing before he would do what he wanted to do. If Jesus was doing that, never feeling he knew God so well, never took initiative of himself, how much more you and I who are not born again. I mean, sorry, who have not lived with God before. So we don't even know him too well to say this is what we'll be doing. Jesus will look at God before he took any decision why he was on earth here. Jesus will hear God why he was on earth here before he said anything. That's why he never failed in anything. And he was God. He submitted himself to God completely. That's what God is expecting from every Christian. Total submission. We have time to look at this in details in our subsequent teachings. Now, the second thing again we see from the creation of man is um, the need for constant fellowship with God. If we read Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, there's something I want to show you there. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. Sorry, chapter 1. Verse 26 and 27. 26 says, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creepy thing that creepeth upon the earth. Mark two things there. Created in his image, created in his likeness. Then in verse 27, he said, so that, he says, so God created man in his own image. In, in the image of God created in him. Female, male and female created in him. Notice in verse 27, he said, in his image, he created him. He didn't talk about likeness again. In verse 26, he said, in his image, in his likeness. He came 27 when he was now finally making him. He said, he was created in his image. He didn't talk about likeness. Like I told you earlier, Bible is very meticulous about the usage of word. And I've also told us the image of God means the nature of God, the character of God. Why the likeness of God is his glory. The essence of God itself, his power, his wisdom, his strength, his riches, honor, and all of that. So when God was creating man, what he did is to put his spirit in it. Like I told us, his nature is in his spirit. His character is in his spirit. It's in his person. The character of a person is in that person. It's not in another thing. So the character of God, the nature of God, the behavior of God is in God's spirit. That spirit was put in man so that man can assess it. But the power of God, what God did is when Adam was related with God in the garden of the day, before he fell, as he was related with God, the power of God, the glory of God was rubbing off on him. You know, the more you stay close to somebody, the more you develop some things and traits of that person in you. So the more Adam was related with God in the Garden of Eden, the more he was assimilating, the more the glory of God was depositing on him, the more he was being transformed to the glory that God was carrying. Let's see that in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. That glory can be transferred as you relate with somebody. And that is how what God meant when he said he will create him in his likeness. He will have the capacity to um, carry the glory of God as he was interfacing with God. Jet, um, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image, from glory to glory, as by the Spirit of the Lord. So, as man was relating with him, it was the glory of God was rubbing up on him, was developing the glory of God, the power of God, was acquiring the power of God, the wisdom of God, the knowledge of God, and the, the strength of God as he was relating with him. 
Now, let me prove to all that this, what we're saying, is what actually took place. If you go to um, Romans chapter 3, let's see what Romans chapter 3 is saying. Romans 3, and we see 23 there. Romans 3, 23. Sorry. It says, for all sin and came short of the glory of God. Note, came short. Came short means something is expected, a level is expected. You didn't get that level. Then something happened, you got few or you got something, but not all. Short of it. He said, it came short. He didn't say, he didn't say man fell and lost glory. He said man has sinned and came short. Not that man has sinned and lost glory. Those are two different things. Those are the mistakes we make. Thinking that when man fell, he lost the glory of God. No, he came short of the glory. What does that mean? The glory that God was expecting him to carry if he had waited in the garden of Eden without falling would have been full. But he didn't carry that full glory. The little he carried, you know, the Bible says, the blessing of God, the gift of God, is without repentance. God didn't collect it back for him. The same way he didn't collect back from Satan, the power, when Satan fell. So the glory that's accumulated from the time that Adam has lived with God or has related with God in the Garden of Eden, he was still carrying that. The wisdom he got, he was still carrying that. The power he got, the strength he got, he was still carrying that. But he didn't get the fullness of it. He got, he got short of what he was supposed to carry. What am I trying to say here? When the Bible says man was created in God's image and likeness, he carried God in himself. Through that, he could manifest the nature and the character of God. By his relationship with God, by his daily communion with God, he will carry the glory of God. He didn't carry it, no, he fell short, Adam fell short. The same way, if you give your life to Christ today, God is expecting the kind of power you will need to humiliate the devil for him. The kind of strength you will need to humiliate the devil for him. The kind of wisdom you will need to humiliate the devil for him. You get it as you relate with him daily or from time to time. That is one of the reasons why Bible Bible expects us to pray and be in communion with God regularly. As long as you are not going to be in communion with God, you cannot humiliate the devil for God. And if you cannot humiliate the devil for God, then there is no need for life. Because the essence of your creation is to humiliate the devil for God and subdue him. When you now see Christians in our days who contract praying to someone else, then why are they living? They are not fulfilling the purpose. They are not doing why the things that may God to create them. They are not acquiring sufficient power to deal with the devil. They are not acquiring sufficient power to humiliate the devil. And they are now giving the devil the audacity to stand before God and, 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 and challenge God and say, you see now, you see now, you see, you are just being wicked to me. Nobody has succeeded here now. No Christianity without fellowship. No matter the work we're doing, no matter the, our pastor who has so much anointing that are having the covering of us, we must develop constant relationship with God. We, will make, we must make our time out of no time to relate with God in prayer and the studying of the word. Without wish, we are going to allow the devil to humiliate God instead of God humiliating the devil. I know you've been wondering, what am I saying? Don't forget when, when David fell, when David slept with uh, Uriah's wife and killed Uriah. If you remember what God said, nobody knew about that story. Only David knew, and maybe possibly Joab, who they wrote a letter to. And if you remember that place in the book of 2 Samuel chapter 7, when God got angry, he told David, he said, why did you do this thing? He said, you have allowed my enemies to blaspheme me. So who were the enemies God was talking about? He wasn't talking about human beings because no human being knew what transpired. It was only David that knew. So the enemy God was talking about there in that second Samuel chapter 7 was, sorry, chapter 12, chapter 12, chapter 12, second Samuel chapter 12. 
the enemies that God was talking about that I said, you allow my name to blaspheme me, is the devil and the fallen demons. I have boasted before them to you that I have a son who is doing well, humiliate them. We get there. And now you have fallen my hands. You have given the devil the courage, the audacity to stand before me and say, you see, blaspheme my name. Every time you don't humiliate the devil, you do something contrary to righteousness. You are giving the devil the right to stand before God and tell God, can you see? And, and blaspheme the name of the Lord, that God was not being fair to him. Christianity without prayer is no Christianity. Christianity without relating with God is no Christianity. Now, I also told us that when God said he was going to humiliate the devil, one of the things in his heart is that he was going to use man to judge him. Now you know that in a law court, when you go to court, there's the prosecution counsel and the defense counsel. The defense counsel can cross-examine the prosecution counsel. The prosecution counsel can cross-examine the defense counsel. It was after all of that that judgment is passed. What is the meaning of that? I'll be able to tell you, the other party will be able to tell you, why did you do the You failure, you didn't failure. So when God said he was going to use us to humiliate means people will succeed where he didn't succeed, even though they're made for inferior material, so that will give them the authority to judge you. And if you are going to judge a person, like I said, in prosecution and defense, the person has the right to cross-examine you and say, you, did you succeed here? You say, I fail. You, God, did you, what about you? Did you succeed here? What about you? Did you do this? Did you do that? So, when God said man was going to judge angels, that gave right to Satan to cross-examine man. Without which, humiliation of the devil will not be possible, will not be just. And you know God is a just God. He must have the right to cross a man for him and angels to be judged. Let's see that in the Bible. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 3. 1 Corinthians 6, 3. We see very clearly there that God said man was going to judge angels. And I've told us in our first teaching that some angels fell with the devil. The devil is their leader or was their leader. Some angels were with him who fell. So God was going to use man to judge those angels. He said in chapter 6 of, uh, of 1 Corinthians, verse 3, he's saying here that, uh, Know ye not that we shall judge angels how much more things that pertain to this life? We are going to judge angels. And since angels, funny angels are not here with us, Satan, who was their leader then, who is now on earth with us, is their representative to judge us on their behalf. To, uh, sorry, to cross-examine us on their behalf. So you can see the reason why sometimes you see people going through pains and God will keep quiet. Because for God to fulfill his purpose of humiliating the devil, the devil must have the right to cross-examine you. That means the devil will have the right to ascend to God and accuse you before him. You are very about accusation of the, of the devil. It's based on humiliation. It's based on the fact that you are going to judge angels and judge fallen spirits. So, let's proceed. I said, I said, this is the reason why God didn't stop the devil from accessing the Garden of Eden. He has the right to go and try Adam, to go and check out whether Adam will go his route or not, to go and offer Adam something that God said he shouldn't do. If we must judge them, they must have the right to process them in us. We all know the story of Job. It's a very popular story that everybody knows. It's a typical example. In uh, Job, I don't want us to read it because of our time, because we, it's a very familiar story. Job chapter 6, I mean, sorry, Job chapter 1, from verse 6 to 12, and Job chapter 2, from verse 1 to 7. 
God was the one that called Satan. I said, come. When he came to him, he said, come. I feel saying, Job, a man after my heart that is sure evil, a man that is good, a man that is righteous, nobody like him in all the earth. And then we said, give me the permission to try that out. Let me cross-examine him before you start saying he succeeded. Then I will believe that he has done, I mean, he has succeeded. I will believe that he can humiliate me. He can, he can judge. And we all know the story, how God gave him that permission. I did all manners of things to the devil and God was worship. When I was much younger in the spirit, I used to feel God was just enjoying people going through pains unnecessary. I didn't know it's because for God to relate the devil that has promised him from the beginning, devil must have right to cross his army man. And that why devil is crosses any man, God is going through pain because if devil should succeed, he will bless them God. That's the truth. We have said that I've given you that example in David. We've seen that in Psalm, Psalm chapter 8 too. And so many other passages in the Bible where the, the, the devil will blaspheme God when he succeeds. So God is not taking any pleasure in our pain. It's because he has made pronouncement that he was going to humiliate the devil and that give the devil right to cross examine us. And that um, when God asks any son, any time, he wants to show up that son to the devil. The same way, behind us, without knowing what is happening in the spirit realm, from time to time, God boasts of us to the devil that I have a son that has succeeded in everywhere and he has succeeded where you failed. He has instituted righteousness, he has maintained righteousness, he has kept righteousness where you failed to do. And definitely anytime God says that, devil will say, let me cross his army. That was what happened to Job. Then we see the same story in the book of Luke chapter 22, verse 31 to 32. Let's read that one. We know the story too, but let's just read it so that we know that uh, we do justice to everything. Luke 22 from 31 to 32. Luke 22, 31 and 32. It says, And the Lord says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan had desired to have you, that he may save you as a wheat. He had, this, he had to have you. He had made a request to deal with him. Why? Don't forget when Jesus was asking, Who am I? Who do people say I am? It was Peter that came up and said he was Christ. And Jesus told him and said, eh, eh, Simon, bad Jonah. He said, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father in heaven. He said, for the reason upon this law, will I build my church and the gate of hell will not prevail against it. And he went further to say, I will give you the key of heaven. He was boasting of Peter. Jesus, who is God, was boasting of Peter here. And Satan heard and he asked, let me deal with him and others. And don't forget, in this next uh, verse, he said, But I have prayed for thee that thy faith faileth not. Why did you have to say that he should have been refused or God should have stopped him? No, he won't stop him. Because Satan has the right to cross examine us if we must judge angels. We also see the same example in the story of Jesus, our Lord himself. Remember, Jesus went, was baptized by John the Baptist uh, in, um, in Matthew chapter 3. I don't want us to read that too because of time. These are familiar stories. Immediately he was baptized. The Bible said, he, he said, a voice came from heaven. I said, this is my beloved son, in whom I were pleased. So, God was making a public proclamation that is well pleased with Jesus. Satan held that. You are well pleased with him? How? Why? He needs to be cross-examined. And you remember, I think let's read it for those who are not that familiar with the story. Matthew 3 from 16. Matthew 3 from 16. It's good we read it so that we know that these things are in the Bible. Matthew 3. From verse 16. It says, And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway 
out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now let's see the next verse. In chapter 4, that, that's the end of chapter 3. Let's go to chapter 4 of St. Matthew. Verse 1, it says, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. That show of that God made, that uh, statement that God made that it was pleased of Jesus was why Satan said, yeah, this man must be causes I made. And he said, to be tempted of the devil. And God couldn't do anything. If not, how can you humiliate me? If not, what justification will God have on the last day to say, why did you fail? When everybody has failed. So, we know Jesus went through all manners of things in the hand of the devil. You too will go through all manners of things. No man. Personally, in my relationship with God, I've gone through a few things. I remember when I gave my life to Christ in 2001, things were so difficult. A lot of things sometimes. I would sit down in my room and cry, shed tears. And then... Um, while I was trying to cope with those things, I understand. Around 2013, I have a very good friend who God said were friends in the spirit, just like Peter and John. And God revealed to him towards the end, I think December 2013, that now the devil said he was going to lead a battle against him and against me. And so we enter 2014. For those of us who know my story, four months later, something very tragic happened. That led me to go into prison. That led me to leave my job. I was in prison for 17 months. I was dismissed from the work I was doing. And I went back home. When I go back home, the little money I've gathered that I was going to start a business with, God spoke to me just immediately after I left that job and told me that the devil said he was going to waste all my money. I was like, I was just coming out of what the little money waste all my money. Why would you stop it? As at that time, I have not understood some of these things I'm talking about now. And one day, when the money was going, something happened one time that I was so depressed. I was tired of life. And God came speaking, son, why are you allowed the devil to raise his leg against me and say that he's winning the battle? I will not forget that day, 2016, August. Son, why are you allowing the devil to raise his leg against me saying he's winning the battle? What am I bringing out of here? The same way sometimes God is not coming to rescue because God has boasted about you to the devil that this is my son. He's going to keep the righteousness no matter what comes on him. And the devil is saying, for you to conclude that God, Mr. God, I will need to examine him. I will need to put him through all manners of things. And when he stands, then. Then this is the humiliation you have been telling me about. Nobody can humiliate anyone here when nobody has succeeded where he failed. For you, to, for us to be humiliated, and you say you are a just God, they must pass where we fail. A good number of them must pass where we are failed. And I understood then that life, a lot of things have gone behind us that we don't know. Just like Job did not know that um, there was a discussion about him between God and the devil. Accusation here and there. I've seen quite a number of it. I've been privileged that sometimes God will reveal it to me that this is what the devil is saying. I, let me give you one more. I remember there was a time that my our God was speaking to me and I said, son, I'm going to send your friend to you. And that my friend asked him, did God tell you anything to tell him? He said, yes. And uh, he said, I said, what? He said, he had the revelation. He was reading a letter. And in that letter, all manners of accusation. And this boy, he said, um, he has faith, he won't disappoint, he won't do this. 
Don't let him get this car they are giving his colleagues. If he doesn't get that car, you see that all those faith you are talking about were shattered. He does not, doesn't have faith. And he says, as he was reading that letter, his spirit, he was asking God that, what's the letter all about? Who was writing this? He said, God told him, wait to the end. And when he got to the end of that letter, he said, so it's sign, the devil. What am I trying to bring out of this? If God said he was going to humiliate the devil, I don't think he has gone too far to want to have a desire and that desire being fulfilled. And if God said, what I created you is to help me do that for, for me, I don't think that will be too much. And God, when we refuse to do that for him, we are lying the opponent to blasphemy, which is the devil. Anytime you fear God, Anytime you go the way of unrighteousness, anytime you, you, you give in to, to temptations, anytime you are going through issues, and because instead of standing for God on the side of God, you go on the side of the devil, you align the devil to blaspheme God. You allow the devil to say, what right do you have to judge me on the last day when nobody has succeeded where I failed? But you call yourself a just God. You don't have the right. Only you are succeeded and you know I'm not you. Don't judge me when nobody has done what I've not done. I even stayed on earth for you for possibly millions of years. I didn't goof. Why are you coming to judge me? Why are you coming to, 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 to throw me inside hellfire? Because it's our ability to have enough people who have humiliated the devil that will give God the the, the, the justification on the last day to help us to, I mean, to allow us to judge the angels and throw Satan inside hell that you are fed where people with inferior creation are succeeded. We are going to look at that too in details in some other teachings. Again, okay, before I I conclude on that. There's something I want us to see because like I said, Jesus is a perfect example. In everything we are saying here, you see Jesus go through them. I've showed you where he said he triumphed over the devil on the cross. He made public show of him. We've seen also where God boasted of Jesus and the devil said, deliver him to me. Let me cross examine him. Let us see again in John, John 14, 30. Hereafter, I will not talk much with you. For the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. This is when Jesus was about going. He told the disciples, he said, the prince of this world, we know the prince of the world is the devil. He said, the prince of this world comes and he has found nothing in me. The devil will always come to examine us. To prove to God that there is justification or no justification for humiliating him. And thank God, Jesus did not disappoint God. Jesus did not disappoint him. Jesus did not disappoint you and I. The devil couldn't find anything on him. He couldn't find unrighteousness on him. Once there is unrighteousness in you, that is the property of the devil. You have blasphemed God. The purpose of your creation to humiliate the devil is defeated. The purpose of your creation to help God to judge angels is defeated. Let's go to the next thing. I said implication of procreation. Let's see Luke chapter 10 verse 16 and John 5 23. Luke 10 16. The implication of procreation. Luke 10 16. Sorry. 10 16. says, Yet he that heareth you heareth me, and he that despises you despises me. 